All right, thanks. I hope you guys enjoyed lunch. Um, so we're going to get started with the second part of our afternoon. I just have one little bit of business uh, to take care of first. So um, the Google Glass, uh, they're doing the drawing right now, and they're going to post the winners on the LDSC Yammer group. So if you are waiting in anticipation for a turn, please check the Yammer group to see if you are one of our lucky winners for the afternoon. If you are a lucky winner from the, this morning and your tenure is coming to a sad close, um, please report to the Media Commons Room 133 where you picked them up during the break right after this first panel um, to return them and uh, let a colleague have a turn. So thanks with that. I'm going to turn it over to Jackie who will introduce the afternoon. Thank you. And Sherwin, where are we now? Which section? <laughs> we, we are in the plan section, so this morning we heard about student thinking and student motivation and student learning. Now we're going to move into talking a little bit more about planning, and not just planning for tomorrow, but for planning for the future. So I've asked Kyle and Annie if they would come in here and get us started thinking in that frame of mind for our afternoon sessions. Thanks. So um, I'm Annie Taylor. I think I know a lot of you, but a lot of new faces. It's been really fun to get to, to meet everybody. Um, I'm in the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences with the Dutton E-Education Institute. And uh, I, I'm like, this is the part that excites me so much. The morning was awesome, but the planning. You know, we in our unit, and I'm sure in your units, we've been really involved with strategic planning. and Where do we want to be in five years as a university, as individual units? But we've had the most fun thinking about, like, where do we want to be in 10 years, in 15 years? Like, what are our moonshot ideas? And it's been so fun to have, we've had a couple retreats, we've done different surveys of all our people, to fun to see people get really jazzed up about this and get really energized. Like, you mean we can have a say in what we might do? And the truth is that the learning design community is where those great ideas are, are really coming from. We've got faculty who are amazing, who we work with, um, and, and, and some teach us more than, than we ever knew. But the, the norm more seems to be, at least in our college, a faculty looking to us and saying, I don't know, what's possible? What could we do? I would really love to do, and then they go off to describe some bizarre thing that you just can't even imagine, and you go, oh, yeah, I don't think we can do that. But then you have that like shower moment or driving to work moment where you go, oh wait, what if? What if we did this or what if we did that? And that's what makes our field so exciting. So um, I have a glimpse of what we're going to be doing this afternoon. And um, I think it's going to be so much fun. And I encourage you to really think outside the box. Don't just think what's possible today or what might be possible in the next year or two or three. Like, what could we make possible? What could we make happen? And that's where we're going to come up with some really neat ideas. Thank you very much. What a morning, huh? This is fantastic. See, this is my first summer camp, and uh, it has just been um, so fantastic to enjoy this event. It's really more like a big old group hug, right? <laughs> so if you, if you feel the need, just reach out and hug that person sitting next to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, unless you're sitting next to Sherwin, he, he feels uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, I once heard somebody ask, would you rather hug a complete stranger or let them use your cell phone? Hug the stranger. You'd, would you, you'd hug the stranger? Is that right? Definitely. No doubt about it. So as we talk about our next theme, uh, dealing with planning, it reminds me of uh, something that FEMA has. FEMA being Federal Emergency Management, right? That they have this thing called the Waffle House Index. Anybody ever heard of this before? Right? Yeah, this is a real thing. So what, what FEMA does is when there's an area that's been affected by some kind of disaster, a tornado or a hurricane, something like that, things that don't necessarily happen here in Happy Valley, I've noticed. So these happen in other places, trust me. The, uh, that they can determine the level of devastation on the ground based on how the local Waffle House is operating, right? So if they go to that area and the Waffle House is open and they're serving warm meals, then well, how bad could it have been the Waffle House is open? 
But if Waffle House is closed, oh my God, that must be Armageddon, right? Because the Waffle House is closed. You see, what it means is, is this isn't a specific indicator of, of the level of damage in that particular area, but what it does is it gives us some idea of what's actually happening on the ground, right? And so as we engage in these planning processes, that's our opportunity to look at this and say, what's actually happening on the ground? Now, as a way, we don't have to have exact measurement in every dimension at every time, but really to think creatively about how do we realize or how do we recognize when something compelling is happening, right? That Waffle House Index. And in so doing, we begin to avoid that Schrodinger's cat type of scenario where it both works and doesn't work. So in the absence of any real evaluation, it, it is both at the same time, right? So something to think about as we move forward today. But again, fantastic morning. I'm looking forward to the afternoon. All right, so planning. We're gonna, we have two things going on this afternoon. The, the second part of the afternoon will be breakout sessions, and we have a great lineup of people who will be sharing ideas and strategies and, and tools to help us in our planning process. And earlier, before that, we're gonna be talking about situations that we might have to plan for. So all about planning. Um, I know it's rough being in the afternoon. I don't know why I picked the Thursday afternoon session. You know, you just went for a walk, you had s'mores, um, got pictures taken, so it was a really fun day, and then you come back to sit in this chilly room again. So I want to keep everybody involved, so we're going to play a game for the first hour. Um, <laughs> you, need to all, <laughs> you need to all participate. You all have clickers. If you don't have a clicker, there should be extra ones floating around there. Um, don't, don't change things by, by taking multiple clickers to skew your results here. This is a very, very serious game. How many people have seen One Versus 100, the TV game show One Versus 100? All right, so some people know about it, some don't. Those who don't know, great, because I took such liberties in revising this to make it my own game. So you won't know anything about it. This is exactly how it is. So <laughs> basically in One Versus 100, there is one person who is trying to beat 100 people. Um, we made, again, we took some liberties. So we don't have one person, we have a team. And our team represents various groups that might be involved in planning a planning process. So I'm gonna give you a chance to meet our audience and you may know some of them, or meet our team. You may know some, but not all of them. And pay attention to where they're sitting in the lineup because these are people you're going to be voting for. Uh, test, yes, I believe it is. Okay. Good afternoon. We're gonna have a lot of fun today. My name is Daniel Foster. I'm a faculty member in the College of Agricultural Sciences. <laughs> and I'm Melanie Miller Foster. I'm also a faculty member in the College of Agricultural Sciences. Um, hi, I'm Kathy Holsing, and I am the Director of Learning Design in the newly named, let me get this right, Filippelli Institute of E-Education and Outreach in the College of Liberal Arts. Wow. Hi, I'm Crystal Ramsey. I am a research associate. I do instructional consulting at the Schreier Institute, where I focus on things like curriculum development and assessment. I'm Robin Smale, can you not hear me? <laughs> okay, just checking. Um, I work at TLT Studio where I work with uh, user experience uh, and the web. I'm Zach Siddick, I'm currently on the wait list for camp. Um, <laughs> I, I registered yesterday, so I don't know why I got on the wait list. Um, I'm also a multimedia developer for ETS. So this is our team, which would be one if we were doing the true game. And in the game, there are 100 that the team or the one would be against. We don't have 100, we have a mob of, what, about 160 some people. So that's our mob. Um, and in the, the TV game show, the, the intent is for these to beat you. And in this game, we're all going to be winners because we're all going to share experiences and hear from each other. We can all be winners, Sherwin. <laughs> We're all winners. Okay, okay, uh, okay, it got, it got him. And true to the game show, we have our own Bob Saget. None other than our Chris Stubbs. So he will be our host who will get us through this show. He'll explain our rules. He 
is the judge as well. So if something comes up that doesn't sound right, he gets final say. And let it be known, I love judging people. All of you, <laughs> especially. So. All right, so welcome to our pseudo one versus 100 versus the team versus the mob versus something. Uh, this should be a lot of fun. So the way this game is going to work is the Jackie Tron 5000 random learning design computer has randomly created a series of six questions. Jackie Chan? What? No, that's... The Jackie, yeah, the, the Jackie Tron. It was funny. Oh, you guys are ruining the whole thing. Right, now I'm judging, judging. Um, has randomly asked our esteemed panel here answers to these questions that all have to deal with various learning design things planning into the future. We are going to ask you, the mob, who said what. And you get to respond using your clickers. So based on what you know of our panel, which may be a lot, which may be a little, each of you get the chance to vote. If you guys get it right, the mob wins. And if you get it wrong, our panel wins. And though everyone can win, in a much more important way, some of you will be losers. And that's <laughs> very problematic. So does everybody understand what's going on so far? All right. That looked like affirmation. So we're going to go ahead with it. So it's, all right. So that brings us to our first question, which has a bit of a primer associated with it. Ahem. There is a growing trend on university campuses in which students are doing more content creation and design across the spectrum of disciplines. More colleges, universities, and libraries are developing environments and facilitating opportunities to harness the, this creativity and building physical spaces where students can learn and create together integrating content and product-centered activities as part of their instruction. In this utopia, this is the primer. So we asked our panelists, what do you think about this idea? One of them gave this response, which I trust all of you can read. I can read it. Can everybody see this OK? All right, so take a moment. Please decide which of our panelists said this quote. Do 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 do. Was permission impossible? I don't really know what that was. That's... All right, we've got 42 responses in. You now have 10 seconds to respond before voting will be closed. Choose wisely. Judgment is happening. Five seconds. Two seconds. One second. Denied. Our polling has stopped, and the audience says that it was C. Hmm. Okay. So before we reveal the correct answer, let's get someone who voted A. Who, who voted for A here? Because we're not anonymous. This is the moment. We have an A. Why did you say A? We just couldn't have picked the Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Just how, like that. How am I to judge you if I can't know you? That's really the All right. So why did you choose A? You, <laughs> excellent. Excellent. So. You, you know the people? OK. So fair enough, fair enough. All right. Our lowest vote getter was answer E, which, <laughs> which corresponds to Zach Zinnick. So, <laughs> so the only <laughs> All right, so who that didn't make a mistake voted, <laughs> voted for Zach? And at least one of you did. All right. Why did you vote for Zach? I appreciate the <laughs> That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Well, the mob has said C. So the correct answer appears to be C. So the mob is correct. Nice. So C, Crystal, would you like to tell us, uh, perhaps elaborate a bit more on your thoughts here? Yeah, so the question is, is making learning. So what is making anyway? Right. Well, if you come at it from, well, making is any time you create, construct, bring forth, all of those kinds of things, um, we're making. And it seems to me that when we are designing instruction, it's easy to fall into 
one of two scary traps, or maybe both of them, depending on what we're designing for. One is the trap where um, opportunities abound for students to make, and we fail to either see them or to capitalize on them, and instead we kind of subject them to these low-level experiences that really don't give them opportunities to grow and learn in ways that they could. The other trap is that we provide many and amazing opportunities for them to make, that is construct, bring forth, create, all of those things, but it's haphazard and not linked to learning objectives and it's fun, but it's random and disconnected. Um, so those are a couple of traps. And so I thought, in the spirit of camp, six quick takeaways, if I can. They're very fast. I'll go very fast. So here's what we need to do when we design instruction. This is about planning, right? So planning for instruction. Give students opportunities to make, to put things together, to create, to form, to bring about. Second, provide opportunities for them to make with others. Sarah said this morning in the motivation panel, learning is a social activity. So opportunities to do that. Assure that when we ask them, that what we ask them to make is relevant, respectful, and worthy of their investment in the activity. I was thinking about, was it Michelle who was sitting here this morning? I, sorry, I can't remember her name. We need to design for her and others like her and be respectful of their time and give them important, respectful things to do. Um, create experiences and provide resources that scaffold that making. Be sure that what we ask them to make will give us evidence about the extent to which they are meeting our learning objectives. So not just making for the sake of making, because it's fun and we can have them do things, but that it's linked to learning objectives. And then, in particular, from an assessment perspective more than anything else, to think hard about how we will measure and provide feedback about the adequacy and quality of what they have made. So yes, thank you, Ms. Moran. Excellent. Well answered. <laughs> So thank you very much, Crystal, and congratulations to the panel, who is now up one nothing. Or no, say the mob. Mob. This is this is very, it's very confusing when you change all the names of what the groups are. So congratulations to you guys. Panel, you better be careful. It's time to move on to question number two. Who's ready for it? We good? Okay. <laughs> all right. Question number two. Who said? This, in response to the question, which way is online learning going to go as the years roll by? Gradual growth, global domination, near extinction. What does this mean for us? So a very potentially positive question here. And who gave the following answer? So we're going to take a look, take a moment to, oh, wait, wait. You're, you're right. This, this, this question, this is a hard question. Would you guys agree? It's probably tough to figure out who said this. <laughs> That's not the way that the Jackie Tron 5000 has programmed. <laughs> so, because this is such a difficult question, we've decided to give you guys a lifeline. That's right. Jackie Tron 5000 will now randomly remove one possible answer. You guys normally would get to pick the lifeline, but I have the microphone, and so that <laughs> this is the way it's going to happen now. So, all right, Jackie Tron, Jackie Tron. Yeah, this is hard to say. Jackie Tron 5000, please randomly remove one of our answer choices before the audience makes their choice. Yeah, preferably not the right one, but <laughs> maybe. These things happen. <laughs> we can just skip the question. No, it didn't go away. <laughs> All right, let's pick one. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we are going to get rid of D. Answer, D. <laughs> All right, so Jackie Tron 5000 has removed answer D. The voting is preparing to begin. Mob, time to choose. Who said the following? The responses are flowing in, up past 70 now. This, this is a record high, I'm pretty sure, for like the last five minutes. So this is. All right, you have now 10 seconds to respond if you have not done so already. Five, two. I'm really actually interested to see how many of you voted for D even after was it eliminated? Because doesn't that happen all the time? So it's, our polling has now stopped. And yes! Yes! I love you too, whoever you are. <laughs> Best buds. All right, I, I've got to ask. 
Someone. Who, who brave mobster? <laughs> All right, in the absence of anyone fessing up, we're going to assume it was Sherwin. So can we give Sherwin a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. I think I was pretty good if I could get two votes. That's pretty impressive. And you were, yeah. I'm not proud of mine. All right, so B looks like the dominant answer, but uh, who, who voted for B? Give me, give me someone who chose B. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so the use of numbers <laughs> is what is has driven. A, <laughs> all right. So what about someone who chose a member of our esteemed faculty panel? So we had a couple of votes for A here. Fourteen. Who chose A? Now you already chose Robin. We know that. So it's, <laughs> So no one wants to fess up on A. A could be right. Jackie Tron 5000, could you reveal the correct answer? It's B. <laughs> this, this mob is pretty good. This is pretty good. So, all right, Kathy. We know that you're an administrator, and thus you are one who uses numbers. <laughs> so, <laughs> would you like to speak to this a little bit more? Wow, that, that business degree really is helping me out here now. <laughs> Um, I had to look up the 12%, okay? I did not know <laughs> yeah, that right, right off the top of my head, I have to admit. Um, well, when I was answering this question, you know, some of you may know that our unit in liberal arts is, is in the midst of running a MOOC for the first time, a MOOC slash mock. So we're dealing a lot with numbers and how many students and all that kind of thing. So, um, And I think some people a while ago thought that MOOCs were going to be the global domination you know, kind of phase, and now that's kind of, you know, maybe people are realizing, well, gosh, that, that might not actually happen. But the thing that I found most interesting about MOOCs was not really the fact that, oh, people are learning online, because we all know that people have been doing that for a long time, but the fact that people and faculty who weren't talking about teaching were suddenly talking about teaching. Even if some of us who've been working in online learning didn't think that maybe their designs were at the best that they could have been, but still people were talking about teaching that, you know, when computer science professors are suddenly talking about how to teach, I mean, I call that a win for anyone who's in the learning design field. So um, I think that, you know, kind of where that's leading us is from my history of being in this field for a while, when I first started at the World Campus, one of our biggest challenges was convincing faculty that we were working with that, you know, this is a legitimate way to teach and the students can actually learn online and kind of had to convince people that, you know, this is a good way to, to spend some of your time is working with us and developing these courses. Now, the challenge that we're having, particularly in our college, is our academic units are so invested in this concept in many ways that now we're having issues like, um, okay, we, we are teaching, you know, six, seven, eight sections of English 15 online every semester. And the English department wants to be able, each of those faculty that are teaching want to be able to customize that class and make it their own and be invested in that process and teach the way they want to teach online, not the way someone who designed the course a year or two ago thought it should be taught. So how do we do that? How do we make, how do we build in that flexibility? And that's the challenge that I see is happening in the immediate future is we've gone from, wow, I don't think this is gonna work at all to, okay, now I wanna do it my way. And how do we build that in? Excellent, thank you very much, Kathy. And congratulations, Mob. You guys are now up to nothing with only a couple questions left to go. Time to move on to question number three. And this one, so we talked about planning. Why don't we plan deep into the madness that could potentially be the future? Because uh, we asked our panelists to describe their vision of the university of the future. And one of them had the idea that universities would be like Disney World and Space Mountain is the classroom. <laughs> if anyone else's mind's blown, yeah. So the voting has begun. Is it? The Daniel Melanie faculty duo. Is it Kathy, our assessment expert Crystal, technologist Robin, multimedia expert Zach? 
you now have 11 seconds. Five seconds. Do 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 do. <laughs> and time is up. So. Why is that even Jeopardy? I don't know what time it is. <laughs> I'm making up theme songs. <laughs> So one of the things I've learned is, is apparently we, we don't think that our, our academic side of the house has creativity, <laughs> and we don't think that our multimedia side of the house has numbers. So, <laughs> okay. So uh, it looks like the vote, highest vote getter was Robin D. So who voted for Robin? Give me somebody. All right. Right here. That sounds like something Robin would say. All right, what about somebody who voted for E? Zach. Oh. So a little bit of investigative journalism here. Interesting. Well, let's reveal what the true answer is. Is it A, B, no, C, D, or E? The mob has been denied. Oh. <laughs> well done. I, I know how to spell pedagogy. <laughs> so now we have an exciting one versus the panel versus the mob first. That's right. It's time for a presentation interlude. Yeah, that, it sounds more exciting in my head. But <laughs> with such a provocative idea, we figured, well, we need to actually see what this looks like. So Zach. Please, take us to your vision of the classroom of the future. All right, so I have slides. Um, not because I'm an overachiever. Um, my mom told me I never amount to anything but average, and I don't want to disappoint her. Um, so the reason I have slides is because I made this pre presentation already once before. Uh, during, a, <laughs> during an activity we did uh, about a, I don't know, a few weeks ago called Living Dead Week, where we, us and ETS basically took a week and uh, worked on something that was sort of out of our normal realm of expertise or sort of like a pet project. And then at the end of the week on Friday, we presented on that project. So in February of this year, uh, my wife and I went to Disney World, uh, attempting to escape the fabulous winter uh, we had here. And when I told my coworkers that uh, my wife and, and I, in particular, were going to Disney World, they were rather confused, um, considering my personality lies <laughs> somewhere in between these two. Um, but I have my reasons, and I'll attempt to explain them. Uh, so one of uh, my favorite things at Disney World uh, on this visit was uh, an attraction called Test Track. Uh, the attraction is basically, the concept of it is that you, you run through the design phase of a concept car. Uh, and, and the first stage of the ride is basically you walk through the line where there's all these like display models and art and everything to do with the process of designing uh, and making a car. Um, and then the second part of that is uh, everybody gets to use a touchscreen application where you actually get to design your own car. And, and you can do things like design the body shape, uh, choose different performance items and whatnot, uh, and it gives you sort of a readout of what you're doing. Uh, then you get on the ride, uh, and as you, the ride is basically taking you through different stages of, or dis different tests of a car and how it performs, and as you're going through the ride, it actually displays how your design is doing. And at the end of the ride, um, there's this huge wall, basically the size of this wall, uh, with a screen on it from all the cars of the day and how your car stacked up to um, the other cars that have been designed. Uh, and the way that's all kept track of is um, this magic band, which I brought a prop today. 
Uh, so that keeps track of your ID and all the information you uh, stored on it uh, while going through the process of the attraction. So why do I like Disney World? It's because of um, the ice cream bars, of course. <laughs> Um, no, because it has really cool immersive technologies like this, and um, it, it really creates a memorable experience for the visitors. Um, so that it kind of made me think, you know, what if a university was like a theme park, like Disney World? Um, and what if the, moreover, what if uh, the classrooms were the attractions? Um, so, and every attraction at Disney World um, seems to have three stages. Um, the first stage is the line, which I described as in Test Track as, as all those models and drawings of designing a car. And it, it basically gets you in the right frame of mind, you know, put away your cell phone, stop interacting with that, you know, put, take, you know, uh, leave the outside world and enter this realm of only designing cars. Uh, the second stage is the ride itself. Um, which is just uh, obviously has to be short, but it's uh, you know impactful and it, it's an assault on your senses. And the third part is a takeaway. Um, so in a Disney ride, after the ride itself, you basically are always dumped into a gift shop. <laughs> so the takeaway is is often a, a, a gift that is themed to the ride. But in a classroom situation, it would be you know the lesson of the day or or whatever. Um, so I took a crack at just designing um, a classroom of the future uh, that, that would be set up more like a Disney ride or attraction. Uh, and we'll walk through the parts here. Um, so this front part is like, you can think of it like a lobby or a, an arcade, uh, at least in my day, theater movie theaters used to have an arcade in the lobby. So this is where you could um, interact with that touchscreen application type thing um, that, and work as teams maybe and get into what is going to be the lesson of the day. Um, and, and that would be the, like the line stage of a Disney attraction. Uh, the second part would be you walk up and you, you completely remove yourself from this first part and, and you enter the, the middle part which looks like a USC, uh, UFC octagon. Uh, and you sit, and uh, the instructor's in the middle of the room, and there's this big multimedia, you know, presentation room where you get a, a, a brief lesson, but it also touches on what you interacted with um, in that first stage of the classroom. And the third stage would be um, the takeaway, which is, um, in my example, would be like a large cafe area where you'd have your Starbucks uh, booth right in the back there. Uh, and then you'd be able to sit around these touchscreen tables and sort of interact with your fellow students and go maybe deeper into what was covered in the day. So immediately, admittedly, this sounds pretty goofy. Um, but, and why would anybody think of a university um, like a theme park? Uh, but why would, you know, Disney think to be, have a theme park? Uh, you know, their initial business was making animated movies. It wasn't making rides, right? So all that might come down to just how universities are marketed. Um, if stuff like MOOCs or educational games were made and targeted towards a younger audience, and then they were known that they were made by the university and that this university was had cool things, uh, you know, that make me want to go there, wouldn't that be cool? And that brings me to the thought of um, sort of so a lot of the technologies we work on and develop for are, are sort of distant technologies, not so much technologies that we use here on campus. It's more for the distance learner on the web and whatnot. This might give us an opportunity to start <coughs> making technology that brings people here rather than keeping them at a distance. And it also gives us an opportunity to, to use all the skills that, of the people like, that are on this panel. Um, we all have different skills and we want to all contribute. And this kind of classroom would give us that kind of opportunity. So I started a Yammer group. It's called Immersive Technologies. Please join and join the discussion.
So this is exactly the kind of provocative things that we want to see coming from our panel versus the mob. So I do want to ask before we move on to the next question. So our, our two faculty panelists, so Daniel, Melanie, what do you guys think? Would you teach in a space that was set up like this? And if, if so, what challenges, what opportunities do you think it might present? She asks if I want to say something, and she's married to me, and she knows that I always have something to say. It's unfortunately one of my weaknesses. I, I was intrigued. Um, it's going to con it connects in a lot of ways on some philosophy and discussion items. Um, the only thing that I guess may even suck, because I'm also very horrible at not showing nonverbals. I tend to uh, read me on the face. The only thing that sit off to me as a faculty member, and maybe it's because um, what I do with my research and what I work with, was the concept that that one stage where the faculty member was at the center. Because I've, I'm working very hard to make sure that it's never about the sage on the stage. It's never about that one faculty member's dynamic personality in the teaching and learning process. And we can talk more about that later because I don't want to give away anything. And again, because I want to win, because I am all about <laughs> winning. And we have some more questions here. But there are some uh, further conversation that we can have. Melanie? Oh, that sounds awesome. <laughs> All right, audience, what do you guys think? You guys on board? Is this the classroom of the future, potentially? This isn't a clicker question, but you could just like, yes, yeah. That's right. We are going to beat the air conditioning in this room through sheer excitement. I love it. All right, time to move on to question number four. So let's see, do we have a setup for this one as well? No, we don't. Perfect. All right. So. The question is, what was your worst experience as a learner, and how could it have been improved? Can everybody see the response OK? Or should I read aloud? Read aloud? OK. No? <laughs> don't read? <laughs> I, I hear one. No. I don't want to hear you. I was going to try it in a British accent, too. Oh, no, no, it's too late. So this also seems like it could be a tricky question. So in my infinite mercy as the host, I've decided to give you guys another lifeline. But this lifeline is not from myself or the Jackie Tron 5000. This one actually comes from the mob, which means we're going to give one of you a chance to ask one of our panelists a question. Now, of course, you cannot ask them, what was your worst learning experience? <laughs> so, you have to think of a creative way to try and figure out who it was. You only get one chance. Only one person can ask. Only one panelist can be asked. I will say, of course, you need not ask the question in English. Mm. Oh. 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 A test, perhaps? So who dares challenge the panel? Anyone? Our first hand, Annie Taylor. Please. Who would you like to ask? Ask Melanie. All right, what would you like to ask her? This is a long shot, but are you or your husband, were you born or raised outside of the United States? Well, that was an apparent choice. <laughs> <laughs> so we have an excellent and appropriate question and a multilingual response. Boy, Mob, this is going to be a tough one. Maybe that has helped you, maybe it hasn't, but the voting is now open. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. see? Yeah. <laughs> Clearly I've missed my calling. Robin, give, give us another one. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> 15 seconds left. Could this be the equalizer that puts the mob and the panel back at 2-2? Two, two? <laughs> Ooh. Go panel. <laughs> <laughs> Voting has finished. Mob, what say you? You say you still think A. So this was either said by Daniel or Menelie. Our next biggest answer, D. Robin. So who 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 asked who said it was Robin? Why did you say that? And who made a vote for A? 
one of our faculty members. Ah, so it is the discipline of our faculty members. Interesting. Okay. All right. So let's go to the videotape. What do we have? The correct answer? Oh, 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 there's so many curveballs. The correct answer is, in fact, A, mob. You have taken it. So it's, I'm sorry, panel. I thought we had them. But so, I tried. I tried. Daniel, Melanie, I actually don't know which one of you said this. So please, would you like to share a little bit more? Um, well, there was obviously no word limit on my answer. So there's not much you don't know about my terrible Spanish learning experience, um, except maybe how I actually did learn Spanish. And it was through the felt need that I mentioned where I was volunteering through the Agriculture Foreign Service and I was actually put in front of a classroom of kindergartners and I could understand enough for them to, to know that they were saying, well, here's your class. And I thought, wow, I have no words to deal with this situation. And so that's how I learned. And my first words were obviously, stop running, <laughs> raise your hand, and don't hit people. <laughs> and so that's really how I learned through a combination of study, but also um, direct application um, almost immediately after I learned the knowledge. And so um, really that's what we are trying to do in agriculture. So I will shamelessly plug a program that we do have going on where we do try to create an, uh, a, the felt need for students by combining Spanish and agriculture. We have a, a program called Spanish for Agriculture where we really try to tie the two disciplines together and show students how learning a language will be important in their future agriculture careers. And so, um, you know, the, through this program, we've seen a lot of um, students really um, excel, I think, um, maybe because they can see the application to their future jobs. Um, but I will say, as one of the instructors for this program, it can be very uncomfortable to um, teach a class in which you're only really comfortable with about half the knowledge. So I really consider myself more of an agriculture specialist. Um, I'm not trained in teaching people how to speak Spanish. And I'm upfront with the students um, in that fact. Just because I speak Spanish, just as I speak English, doesn't mean I'm prepared to necessarily teach you how to do that. And so both instructors have to feel very comfortable when you co-teach a class. But I do think it's important to break down those disciplinary silos when you're trying to show students um, relevance to their future career because they aren't going to operate in the real world just within the silo of their discipline. One thing, I want her to dig a little deeper because we, we actually talked about this and since this is a learning design summer camp, I'd like for you to tell them what your thought process was uh, going through your high school Spanish class. Because you, we talked about that and how you had a, a very clear motivation. We'll flip this over to Jerry Springer talking. in just a minute. So. <laughs> I was going, there will be discussion later. <laughs> we'll talk about this later. Right, so what I was um, telling Daniel about um, was that in um, high school Spanish, I knew that I had to take a minimum of two years to enter university. That was the minimum re requirement at the time. And so I knew I needed to live through these two years. I um, actually came out of it thinking that I was stupid at languages. And I think you hear this from a lot of people that um, I'm not good at language. And I really think um, that it's kind of a small miracle that I ever overcame that. But how I ever made it through high school Spanish, um, and I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this, I just made it through on sheer study skills. I didn't know anything about Spanish, per se, but I could do enough, well enough on each individual test to uh, be able to get a decent grade. And I knew that I needed to do really well on those um, in-semester um, tests because I knew I would fail the final because I couldn't remember and put all the knowledge together and, and decide um, 
you know, uh, how to um, distinguish one grammar point from another on the final. I didn't have the skills, but I could pass the individual test. So as instructors, how do we feel about a student who knows they're going to fail the performance portion of the class? Is that what we're about? If, you know, if I can get the grade, but I can't actually do it, the performance. And that's the learning design challenge for us to think about. Great points. Great points. All right. So, Mob, you guys are back in the driver's seat, but there's still time for our panelists to catch up. So let's jump on to another question, shall we? And we do have another primer here. All right. So... <laughs> Thank you very much, Jackie Tron 5000. We have printouts now. This is fantastic. <laughs> With free, high quality content accessible via the internet, both formal and informal online learning is on the rise, which some fear could dampen the appeal of higher education institutions. Dun, dun, dun. MOOCs are currently dominating discussions about alternate forms of education. So, with that, we ask our panelists the question If one can learn online from some of the best instructors in the world for free. What more, or what can more traditional institutions offer that can compete? Another challenging question. And in our mercy, it's time for your third and final lifeline. But we've given you too much power with that last question. So we're back to, <laughs> it's back to the host and the Jackie Trout 5000. So we will ask now one of our panelists a clarifying question. Selected, of course, at random, Jackie Tron 5000. Who shall we choose to ask a clarifying question of? <laughs> that would be Robin. Oh, okay. Sure. So, I got this. Robin, my clarifying question for you then. This, this question in particular makes mention of uh, micro credentialing. Could you Why tell yes. us a little bit about your thoughts on micro-credentialing? Why, yes. Yes, yes it does. Um, I, I think that uh, as, a, as an institution, uh, one of the things that we need to do is we need to be able to leverage our strengths, right? So that's our brand. That's our resources. That's our size. Um, and even our ability to fail fast and fail, fail often. Um, but what's really going to be critical is going to be uh, con just student content discovery um, and their engagement in the content and what it means to them and how can we actually how can we actually help that uh, so clearly um, yeah I got called out for uh, the micro micro credentialing because I think badging is the next thing right it's what uh, adding gamification it may sound like it's a gimme but you know what I see it time and time again with my kids. I see it time and time again with me because, yes, I am 12. But I like, I like that I can, um, I can earn rewards for learning and jumping through the hoops, so to speak. So um, I, I think that um, the micro-credentialing is going to be integral to student engagement in the future. And I think that that's one of the ways that we can leverage our size and our experience. How's that? Robin, that's perfect. Thank you very much. In fact, welcome, you may have given them too much because, yeah, that might be too close. But now the audience can choose. Who said this? <laughs> 15 seconds left. Nine, eight, six. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, what? seconds go faster than <laughs> I actually yeah. say. Like so, that's yeah, that's a listen. You don't get asked to be a host because you're like good at stuff other than talking. So, huh? huh. Well, that's kind of surprising. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so. This time we're going to go to the, the low end. So only one person chose a member of our faculty duo here. So who, who was the, the lone wolf? The lone wolf. <laughs> who dared to be bold? Someone. Stand for <laughs> <laughs> So was it, was it Sherwin again? That... 
All right, well, we'll move on. All right, so nine people selected option B. Who? Give me some. There we go. <laughs> wow, the game within the game. So Wayne giving Kathy a throwaway pity vote. I don't know how else to describe it. Okay. <laughs> there will be a mob versus the panel rumble immediately following this. All right, what about somebody that said Robin? Which was the most of you? Ah, so a close listening to the word brand. All right. Ah, also gaming the system a bit. Okay. All right, well, let's. All right, well, let's see who actually said this. Oh! Okay, Mom. Okay. Booyah! Thank you. Thank you very much. Good job. Mom, I don't want to tell you your business, but uh, y'all were punked. burned. My goodness. I think that's called getting punked. <laughs> I would say that counts, so please. Daniel, could you tell us? Was this your quote? Yes, this was uh, my response to the question. Um... <laughs> A couple of things I'd share on that. Melanie and I just returned from a USDE-funded experience that we had. Uh, I prepare agriculture teachers uh, in agriculture and extension education, and we spent the past four weeks, like we lit returned on Friday, in the Republic of Korea, where we took eight agri-science teachers and eight teacher candidates, one of them who happens to be in the room, Casty Cheddar at the back of the room, we're proud of that, uh, took them and had them immerse in their context-driven uh, discipline of ag education and visit schools. And while we were there, we met with the Ministry of Education and the Minister of Education, and it was fascinating to talk to him. And I, uh, one thing that came out is he spoke about how the Asian culture, and he particularly spoke about Korea, his country, that they were very focused for a long time. And before I tell you this, my kids' minds were blown when we visited four schools that taught agriculture in Korea, and they talked about the common schedule of a student in Korea <laughs> being starting at 7 a.m. and going till 9 o'clock at night, and then going to a hogwan to learn English till 11 or so at night. That the pure amount of hours put into instruction. So there's this work ethic but the Ministry of Education is saying we've created a, a monster. We've created a situation where we have a culture focusing on resume padding or fluffing of academic credentials. The Minister of Education was telling us this. And about when we saw a presentation and a change in a national education policy to focus on competency. What can you do? Not what piece of paper do you have? Now, obviously, I connect that as I look at our institution. What can you do? The performance piece, the micro credentialing. As Zach said, the takeaway from every class. What can you do? I think that our opportunity um, is to focus on our most valuable asset. And I, sometimes when I come to learning design conferences, now this is where they might start throwing stuff at me. <laughs> Um, or I start engage. Yes, thank you. Or I start engaging in conversation about technology with instruction. I sometimes wonder if people have the same shared value of what is our most valuable asset as a learning institution. Panel. <laughs> Amen, brother. I'm, I'm with you. Our most valuable asset is our people. Nothing more, nothing less, the people. So then we have to look at how we're instructing and how are we maximizing that asset. And that's where it gets back to that 21st century skills that were mentioned, those four C's of collaboration, of critical thinking. How are we putting off the greatest class in the world by the, this magnificent online instructor? The bottom line is they do not have the opportunity to sit in Foster Auditorium right now, look in the eye and talk. And so since we have that opportunity, how are we maximizing that time? Or are we just showing a damn PowerPoint? And see, that's our challenge. If we're going to be successful in these different ways of delivering, is how do we maximize the value of your preparation, your flip class, and whatever you want to call it outside, so that when we are actually in a synchronous environment, looking eyeball to eyeball, that we do something with it and you gain new skills. Um, to lay on to that, everybody, we need to be very proud that not only are we a traditional institution, 
But damn it, we cannot forget that we are a land-grant university and should be damn proud of that. And for 150 years, have had a system attached to us that no one else has called extension. And extension is in every county in the state of Pennsylvania and has a youth group called 4-H. That's not just about agriculture. And so you talk about marketing to a youth group. You talk about targeting younger audiences with your instruction and outreach. Are we leveraging an existing system that we already have in every county in Pennsylvania of extension because we're a land-grant university? Thank you. Fantastic. All right. <laughs> Mission accomplished. All right, guys. So we have a couple more minutes left, and we have one final question that will decide whether or not this is a tie. And indeed, we are all winners. Or something less savory for one of our groups here. So here's the question, our final question of the day. What are the characteristics of a strong educator, and how can learning design support these individuals? Here is the quote. Take a moment to read through it. And voting has opened. So who said this? Fifteen seconds. The responses are slow coming in. I think we might have a stumper here. Don't get nervous, mob. But all your pride is on the line here. Four, three, two, one. Fien, the mob, says D. <laughs> that this was Robin's response. <laughs> with a follow-up of C being Crystal's response. So let me, get, uh, let me get one of the Robin supporters in the audience. <laughs> All right, what about one of our crystal respondents? Ah, references. All right. So, for all the marbles, and to decide whether or not this will be a pleasant ending, or we will go away with blood grudges from this <laughs> event, Jackie Tron 5000, could you please show us the final response of the day? Is it A? Is it A? <laughs> it's A. Oh! Mob and panel tied in harmoniousness. On the one side... <laughs> oh, panel wants blood. Oh, pan <laughs> the panel's upset. On the one hand, it's great. It's a tie. On the other, this is kind of like U.S. Portugal. So you guys, that's, you blew it. Disappointed. <laughs> All right, so please, our A panelists, what do you guys, what, tell us more. Um, it's interesting, of course, my primary discipline is teacher education, uh, secondary agriculture education preparation. And um, so obviously, every fall, well not obviously, every fall I teach a class called Methods of Teaching Agriculture. And I bring in young people who are preparing for student teaching. And so they want to know what makes a great teacher. And so you want to, of course, be driven in your instruction through uh, based in the practice of research. Uh, some of you may have heard of Rosenstein at first. It's actually from the 70s. Uh, it's a very solid piece of work, but I, I admit that it's dated from 73, I believe. They did a meta-analysis of all the studies for the previous 20 years to that, so what, the 50s to the 70s, and identified uh, from those, and it's interesting, most of the part, uh, participants in the studies from the meta-analysis that, that were done were elementary uh, education. But we find that even if we continue to read from the 70s till now, those core five concepts of business-like behavior, of clarity, enthusiasm, variability, and, of course, the opportunity to demonstrate learned criterion. That those five concepts, they show up in all the literature from to now. Like, it's very solid stuff. And I think the key as we look at this question of what is a strong educator and learning design support is to realize that there are truisms that we can work with. 
and the opportunity and the challenge in the Disney world as we approach it in the future is to look at new ways to achieve variability new ways to show enthusiasm, new ways to have clarity. Uh, I'd give an example just to be very clear. Um, Micro-credentialing, going back to that concept, going back to the concept of a takeaway from every class. Um, one of the characteristics that's hardest for my young teachers to understand, like how do I actually, what does that sound like? What does that look like? How do I do that in a classroom and every day is the opportunity to demonstrate learning criteria. What does that mean? Your learners feel more satisfied and therefore more driven to learn more is if at the end of that learning session they can prove to you some way that they actually learned something. So micro-credentialing could provide a way to give them that sense of satisfaction, that badge. I did earn what the essential question was of this learning episode to leave with. And that's where and why I come to these things as a faculty member and reach out to you is because of those incredible tools and learning design to help do that better on a day-to-day -day basis. So, thank you. Excellent, thank you. So, that concludes our game. So, first of all, I want to thank all of you guys for participating. I also want to take a minute to thank our panelists, Daniel, Melanie, Kathy, Crystal, Robin, and Zach, for taking the time to put together some excellent responses. Uh, <laughs> and, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the Jackie Tron 5000, Jackie Ritzko, who actually put together this whole game. So, thank you very much, Jackie. And now I'm going to turn it over to the aforementioned Jackie, who will tell us what's coming next.